Hello, everyone. Welcome back. It's time for another episode of the Ramos Law Difference Makers podcast. And as your host, I, Dr. Jim Hoven, get to meet with cool people. And for those of you that have been with the show for a while, you know that we're probably up to episode 140, 150. I don't even know what it is at this point. Gabe will have to tell us, but we're a ways down the road. And um, today I have actually returning guests. And we don't have many returning guests on the show because there's so many people that are doing amazing things. But this was one that we just really felt was important for people to know about and just so interesting and so cool. And the difference that uh, Joe LaRusso, our guest today, is making not only in our firm but in the lives of pilots around the country is truly, truly magnificent. So, uh, Joe, great to have you back on the show today. Thank you very much, Dr. Hoban. Thank you for those kind words as well. Absolutely. You and I get a chance to spend a good amount of time together through our work scenarios and all that kind of stuff. We haven't gotten to fish together yet, and we keep talking about it. Fly fishing is something that we, we both share. We both love it. And so another spring is dawning. So this is the one. We're this gonna is get it. it. We're going to get it, it done. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to have to fly somewhere because you – are not only the aviation director, the head of aviation law in our law firm, but you are also a professional pilot and you've been doing that for like 20 years. Yep. For 20 years. Yep. I was flying before I was driving and still a professional pilot today. That's so, so cool. Still doing the NASA stuff. Still doing the NASA stuff. Still Talk a little bit that about jet. that. So that jet, it's one of one where ice flight nine and what it is, is it's a weather uh, jet. It's a weather studying jet. A lot of people think that we're, we're the ones that are seeding clouds. We're doing weather modification. We aren't doing that. It is just <laughs> simply testing, uh, uh, finding different stages of weather, most, most focused on when water becomes ice. Where is that significant? In hail, in grapple, those really damaging storms to people's properties, to, um, to their lives. <laughs> yes. You know, damaging and injuring storms. So um, to summarize it into one, one sentence of stupidity, we fly into bad weather. <laughs> <laughs> well, most people don't want to be on a plane, right? They're like, can we fly above it around the bad weather? You're like, oh, we got to go into the storm. We go right into it. And the airplane's full of sensors and full of testing equipment. We got scientists in the back and we often fly with multiple airplanes. Um, in 2024, there's a project on the table right now where we'll be one of three NASA airplanes based out of Greenland for a little bit. So Wow, so you'll um, be going to Greenland. So potentially, yeah. Wow. Yep. So, and is, uh, is that when you're flying, and we'll get into some other stuff, but this is just so fascinating to me. When you're flying into a storm, is it like when you're on a regular jet and you go through a storm and it's really bumpy? Is it like super bumpy for you guys? Do you need extra support and all that kind of thing? You're worried about the plane getting a little sketchy? Super bumpy um, and, and at times uh, pretty violent. Um, but the airplane is a, a 1976 Lear 35. It's an old Lear jet. And back in the day, uh, Learjet was based off of uh, fighter aircraft. So it oh. is inherently strong. It is a very, very strong airplane. Um, arguably stronger than the modern airplanes as well. They're working with a bunch of composites and stuff nowadays. This thing is just pure metal. It just, it, it takes a beating and then just keeps going. Goodness. Um, so, and then when we go through those storms though, it is very well um, prepped, right? So we got, we got a full weather team on the ground that's running four different weather models so they can tell how that storm is going to evolve if we're going to get caught in something. Uh, they're communicating with another airplane who's communicating with us. We're also communicating on the ground. We got two scientists in the back. We have another PI scientist right behind us. And when we're about to go into bad weather, we get the confirmation from the ground. We get the confirmation from the back of the airplane. We get the confirmation from our PI sitting right behind oh, us. What's a PI? Um, so that's uh, the project science principal investigator is what gotcha. they call it, but the project science. Um, so, um, so that person will say, yep, this storm is good to go into this particular cloud, this particular cell is good to go into. And then about 30 seconds before we go in, we go to a sterile cockpit and that's just myself and the other pilot. And that's when we're chatting back and forth saying, okay, we're going to do this. Are we going into this? Um, and then you know, usually we say yes. It's very rare that we'll say no up front and, and say no to all those scientists who know way more than we do. <laughs> but there are times and we'll say, yep, it's going to get denied from the front. So, so you guys see, what do you look for from the front that would, that they might not see? Is there something that you're seeing? So they're, they're using a bunch of, you know, a lot of times they're launching sons, they're launching weather balloons. They got on the ground radar. They, they roll with a bunch of mobile trucks on a lot of projects. So they have everything that is not on the airplane. And then on the airplane, we have radar as well. So when we go to a sterile cockpit, we go to a uh, ship's radar uh, type evaluation. And we're looking for hail columns, anything that's going to damage engines. Wow. So um, that is totally um, something that nobody has access to except the two guys sitting up front. 
and then we make our decision based on that. And do you guys typically fly over um, land-based storms or like ocean-based storms, or does it really depend on what you're looking for? Yeah, it depends. So in 2019, we were on uh, NASA's Camp 2X project that was based out of the Philippines, out of uh, Clark Air Force Base, out of Manila, a little north of Manila. And that was a purely water-based uh, project. So we were flying in the South China Sea, um, hit two typhoons on that one. We were lucky enough to get two passing typhoons that we got in and out of, which were pretty interesting. Um, we had a project here last summer um, in Houston, um, and that was supposed to be water-based um, off of hurricanes coming up through June, uh, in June through Houston. No hurricanes came, so we had to transition to a land-based uh, evaluation. Um, last summer, it was land-based, and it was based out of North Texas, Kansas, Nebraska, that whole line. Yeah, uh, kind of Tornado Alley. Alley. Yeah. So, uh, and we hit cells all the way up and down there. So, Can you yeah. guys tell if there's a tornado happening in the storm that you're about to go into? Like, is there a abort mission? Like, if you get in, oh, that turned into a funnel cloud. We got to go. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we've seen that a couple of times. Wow. So, I've gotten to be in one, uh, one tornado one time. So Was that enough? Yeah, it's <laughs> <laughs> it, it wakes you up real quick. <laughs> Ooh, I can't so, imagine. That sounds amazing. Yeah, really, really fun. And the airplane is actually based um, with a Boulder-based company. So it's a contract airplane. So we'll contract to NASA. We'll contract to NCAR. We'll contract to UCAR, to NOAA. We'll even contract to universities uh, sometimes uh, or state-run projects. Like we did a, a project with the Texas um, – uh, association for weather modification so it's nice we get to see all levels from nasa down to you know like doing a project with the university of wyoming or something like that wow really really cool that's so cool it, are you finding and this go in all kinds of directions my head's just swimming <laughs> with cool just fun stuff with this show so far what about the connection between pilots and space and i think about that because i know that you were in the air force academy and you did your training there and as I was at a football game there with my wife, we were sitting next to some people that were grads been, and then been in the Air Force forever, and they were some of them were with Space Force. Yeah. And so you think about the connection between pilots and, and space. Is there a big difference? Obviously, there's a big difference between an astronaut and a pilot, but is there that connection? Is it pretty tight between what's in the atmosphere and what's outside the atmosphere? Yeah, that, that used to be a very big gap right it used to be you know pilots and then astronauts and over the years that gap has come in and narrowed really and it is becoming very very close i'll give you a good example of that in 2019 on camp x on camp 2x nasa's program at one point in time we coordinated uh, nasa's p3 airplane us in uh, ice flight nasa's uh, sea vessel the sally ride they were on the water it went them um, the P3, and then it was us, and then it was the space station. Wow. And for just a split second, as the space station was coming across that, uh, that area, we all stacked into a line. We all met at the exact same fraction of a second, and we got to slice uh, the atmosphere all the way down um, from the sea all the way through uh, up into space, and we were all talking on the same frequency. So we got to talk to the space station and talk to the uh, the astronauts that were literally doing the same studies that we were doing. They were just doing it in space. Um, so wow. was that yeah. cool? Was that just an amazing experience? Unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Like still it's still kind of like uh, tingly when you think yeah. of it. And, and what was neat about it is when we landed, the space station sent us photos where you could see us all the way bisected. And we were we were one little dot. The P3 <laughs> was one little dot. And then you could see the Sally ride all the way down on the water. Wow. Um, so really, really, really cool. And then a lot of uh, one of my best friends uh, that I went to the academy with, um, he uh, was a test pilot. And, uh, you know, test pilots are like the the top of pilots, right? There's only been like a thousand and some test pilots in U.S. Air Force history. Wow. And he switched over to Space Force, and he's now doing um, uh, basically flight tests within space, uh, within the Space Force. So it's it's just crossing like crazy right now. That's it's so cool. Really, really, really exciting. Amazing. So, so, so one more fun question. Sure. I got to ask you, <clears throat> is the new Top Gun 
as cool in real life as that movie. That movie was <sighs> ridiculous. Oh, yeah. It is the single greatest cinematic adventure <laughs> that this country has ever produced. And, I, and, I and Gabe's, <laughs> Gabe's shaking his head. Are you shaking your head, Gabe? Because <laughs> Gabe, Gabe's a big movie guy. He watches movies all the time. Listen, I have no pause or hesitation when I say that's the greatest thing that we've ever produced in Hollywood <laughs> ever. And, and I always got the question of, you know, well, is it realistic? Does it matter? Yeah. Does it matter? Because <laughs> uh, there are so many people that are going to uh, get into flying and get into the military and fly. Like, it, it, it does amazing things for our industry, and it is so cool to watch. Yes. So I love it. I don't care if it's all made up or if it's all real. It is amazing. I love that movie so much. It's my favorite movie now. My same. favorite movie. <laughs> and it's based on pilots, and that's where I want to take this now. Um, one of the big things you do and you're known for across the, uh, the United States of America is helping pilots who th basically their identity is in question. They right. are, it's called certificate defense right. and something has happened in their life. It might be a medication they're on, something that happened to them, a trauma, a, a misstep in a, a lack of judgment, something happened. And now they're being told you can't fly again until and unless yada, yada, yada. Right. Can you explain what certificate defense is and, and what an important role that plays not only on the pilot's life, but what about the aviation industry? Yeah. So a lot of people don't realize we have two different certificates in our pockets. So we have our pilot's license, which is like your driver's license. And then we also have a medical certificate. And those have to exist at the same time. So you cannot fly if one of those is taken away. Uh, the medical certificate, depending on what type of pilot you are, you could be a weekend warrior all the way up to an airline pilot, right? Um, there's varying degrees of that medical certificate. And all of that matters is how frequently you have to renew that cer certificate. The medical standards from third up to first are the same. The statutes are the exact same word for word. It's just how often you have to be in front of an FAA doctor again. So a hobby pilot has to get a different frequency than a commercial pilot to right. get this thing re-upped. And I would assume the the more sophisticated pilot, so to speak, the the more responsible the, the pilot, the more responsibility of human lives is probably having to test more often. Yeah, and it could be as tight as six months. Wow. So you got to look at this in perspective. In that case, every six months, a professional pilot, and we're not even talking about, like you mentioned, their identity of being a pilot, which it very much is an identity. But if we just look at it from an employment standpoint, what other job are you at risk every six months of losing your entire career? Wow. Like that in a blink of an eye gone. It is the uh, I, I will tell you from my standpoint as a professional pilot, when I go to that appointment every single year, it is the most terrifying day of my entire year. I take blood pressure, uh, like I, I measure my blood pressure five days in advance um, because as I get closer to the event, it rises to the point where it's very high when I'm in the room. Uh, white coat syndrome, as white you know. Co white coat syndrome, um, yes. It, it is amplified into... into um, a category that I can't even, there aren't words for it. It's a, a very, very um, earth shattering event. You know, I, I never thought about this, Joe, that you go through this because, and that's probably one reason why you fight so hard for these pilots because you have to do it every six months, every year, well, you're in your case, but mm -hmm. I, I mean, I can only imagine it being akin to what um, some of the firefighters, law enforcement, some of those folks have to do, but they have. If you don't pass, you get to go to B, C, or D jobs, right? Right. right. Pilots, uh, no passy, no flyy. You're done. And because You're it's done. the exact same standards for every degree of medical certificate, if you fail as an airline pilot on your standard as a first-class medical certificate, you can't even go and rent an airplane from your local airport because it's the exact same verbiage that goes all the way down. So you don't qualify for anything. Wow. So do you think that's fair or unfair? Is that protecting the public the way it should be? Or no. is that something that like, look, if you're not flying that often, there should be a different set of standards. Then give, give me your thought on that. Yeah, that's an amazing question. And I, I, we always face the court of public opinion in this industry because everybody wants their pilot to be uh, perfect health wise, mm -hmm. right? 
without realizing that nobody's perfect health wise, right? We're all human beings. We're all going through the same stuff. And just because you have a pilot certificate does not make you immune to grief, does not make you immune to kidney stones, does not, you know, you still go through the same medical uh, events in life that anybody else does. Um, and it's, it's frustrating that, that, a pilot, uh, an airline pilot is held to the exact same standard as somebody on a weekend warrior, like you said. It's frustrating that that language is the exact same all the way through. Um, and it really, really does need to change. There needs to be some level of air medical reform. How do, how does one go about that? Is that a government thing, a Congress thing? Like who would challenge the FAA to look at their own policies across the board like that? Or is that an uprising of pilots and saying, this isn't right. We're going to I'll go on strike if you don't change this. What what would that look like? And that's exactly what it would look like. It is a uh, it's it's very political. It's it's based in regulations from the DOT, the Department of Transportation, down to the FAA. The F Congress has given the FAA the ability to rule make, and they have not utilized their rule making power for a very very long time. So, um, which brings up a whole another issue of where we do most of our work. But in order to motivate change, you have to motivate a change in the regulations. And in order to change the regulations, the FAA needs to feel enough pressure that they're not gonna get paid, that Congress is gonna pull those purse strings away and say, you're, not, you're no longer serving the body that you're supposed to be serving with the regulations that you're supposed to be serving them with. So in that case, we, we're gonna ask that you rewrite the regulations. So this year has actually been a, a, a pretty strong push from our end, um, doing a lot of talking to senators, a lot of talking to congressmen, congresswomen all over the country. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to push the FAA to prioritize air medical reform because in September they come up to their reauthorization. So every five years the FAA has to go in front of Congress and ask two questions. One, can we still exist for another five years? And two, can we have a bigger budget? Now, of course, they're going to exist. Mm -hmm. um, I don't envision a world where, where they don't exist. But what I would like to see is when they get that bigger budget, which historically they have always gotten, when they get that bigger budget, I would like there to be strings attached to it that says, hey, you will get this money this year upon this action, this money this year upon this action, all the way through the five years. Um, so that's been our big push this entire year is reaching out to those members of Congress saying, please don't let the FAA skate by. And are you heading that, Joe, in, in some direction or is that individual pilots doing all of that? Or is there an organized effort to, to get that? Because, again, for people listening, it matters, right? Mm -hmm. For If they're watching or listening, it matters because you need pilots well served and, and basically have them supported from the people that have control over them. Otherwise it's going to affect all of us eventually in yes. the service that we have, the cost of the service that we have. If we have no pilots yes. and there's a lot less flights, that means it's going to be a lot more expensive. Yes. Right. And, and you're exactly right. Um, so I will say uh, I'll address that question by addressing first the public aspect of it and then going back to what we're doing uh, to change this. Right now, the regulations as they exist, because they are so archaic and because they're so static and haven't kept up with medicine, which, as you know, is very dynamic. We're constantly coming up with new research, new studies, new medication, new methods of treatment, new diagnoses even, right? You know, medicine is always dynamic. Um, but the regs have stayed static, um, and they're back now. The last time the regs were updated were in the late 80s. Um, so what does that mean for the general public? Well, that means that pilots are not willing to tell the FAA what's going on. They're not willing to seek treatment because they're being judged. They're being treated on new treatment, new medicine that's working for them, but they're being evaluated and judged on medicine from four decades ago, yes. right? From three decades ago. So what does that mean? It means one of two things. One, we don't tell the FAA what's going on. Or two, we don't even get treatment, we being pilots, we don't even get treatment for fear of the, re uh, the repercussion from the FAA. So how is that making the public safer? Right. In fact, it's making the public more at risk because you don't know that, that maybe the pilot up front, uh, they just had uh, a relative die or they just got diagnosed with something or, and they're not seeking treatment for it because they know the FAA will ground them and take away their entire identity and career. That's just like what we hear about in um, certain parts of the military, certain parts right. of law enforcement, that they're, 
they can be seen if something gets put quote unquote in their jacket, right. that they can be seen as either weak or they get taken off of their station, right. something happens. And so we see the same thing and it has led to a lack of public safety. So I never thought about it from a pilot standpoint, but that makes total sense. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that number is staggeringly high of, uh, of, of airmen that are lying to the FAA. Um, and along with that, um, especially during COVID, pilots are not immune to the mental health issues that have, that have plagued everybody through COVID. Pilots are not immune to that. Um, and we have found an increase in suicides, in pilot suicides since 2020. Wow. Um, because pilots are not willing to get the mental health treatment that, that, they, that the general public can otherwise get, right? Pilots on the old FAA medical form, the pilots have to report. Um, it says that you have to report any physician visit within the last three years. And then the fine print says, or any therapist or any counselor or anybody, any professional having to do with mental health. So y even going and seeing a counselor, a therapist, um, not receiving medication, not being treated by a psychiatrist, psychologist, just seeing a counselor, um, that is reportable to the FAA and truth be told, groundable by the FAA. And so do you think the problem here, Joe, is that, the, is that it's the, it shouldn't have to be reported or do you think, it, hey, reporting, it's fine. We wanna know that our people are in good hands, but you're not gonna be crucified for it. Like, I mean, to me, I would rather have people tell me, hey, man, I'm going through stuff and here's what I need from you and support in this and that and the other thing versus not knowing anything and then bad stuff happening. Do you think it's, it's hey, report it, but we just have a system for making sure that we can monitor your safety and effectiveness? And that, that goes full circle to, the, to your question before is what are we doing to, to address this issue? So the first layer for the FAA grounding an airplane, uh, excuse me, a pilot for something medical is that medical application. Uh, it's the FAA form 8500-8, it's only the eighth edition of that form in the FAA's history. Um, if we change just one sentence on that form to where pilots do not have to report a therapist, do not have to report a counselor, and only have to report a mental health condition when it escalates to the point where it needs uh, pharmaceutical intervention, or it needs intervention from a psychiatrist or from a hospital. Um, certainly those could be reported and should be reported. But if a pilot has the ability to go see a therapist and go see a counselor without having to report that to the FAA, the amount of pilots who would do that would be significant. Yes, It would be exponential. There would be so many pilots who would do that uh, just purely based on the stress of a job of flying a, a hunk of metal defying physics for, f you know, four hours defying gravity and flying <laughs> through the air with 200 souls behind you. That's a stressful job. That's a big deal. They would go and see a therapist, go and see a counselor without fear of being grounded by the FAA. And a, what would otherwise be a small condition would not uh, evolve into something far worse to the point of suicidal ideations and eventually, you know, uh, suicide, yeah. right? So our push right now for the, uh, for Congress is on the, uh, the modification of the 8500-A to require, uh, to, to remove the sentence that requires pilots to report therapists and counselor. And we're doing that by reaching out to members of the aviation subcommittee, uh, the transportation subcommittee, and then just generally senators, congressmen, congresswomen, any members of Congress, we're reaching out to them uh, very, very fortunate here at Ramos Law that um, that we have uh, the bandwidth and the ability to have those meetings with those members of Congress to voice the opinions on behalf of our uh, clients, their constituents. Um, so you're kind of leading the charge for a bunch of pilots. You're speaking on behalf of lots of these folks. That's right. There are there are big uh, groups, right? All the unions, ALPA, SWAPA, APA, Teamsters, and there's also AOPA for the general aviation pilots. There's also MBAA for the commercial operators. Um, but those big lobby groups are generally focused on one or two things, and a lot of times they forget about uh, Aeromed. So what do we do then? Well, that, that falls on us, right? We're the ones who represent these pilots in aeromed conditions. And while we are successful pilot to pilot to pilot on a micro sense, it's not enough. We got to be successful on a macro sense for the industry, right? It's one of those things where we'd rather work hard now to not have a job in the future because we solved it at the higher level. You yes. know, um, that's better for the industry. That's better for our clients overall. 
Um, so we're doing that. We're pushing that in the aviation division. And we're also trying to, to reach out to members of the community and pilots themselves saying, go to your, go to your congressman, right? Go to the people that are, that are your voice in Congress and tell them before September, please uh, make the FAA address the aeromedical concerns. That's so good. So many questions have popped up while you were just talking. I want to get to a couple of those. First of all, how many? do you know how many pilots there are of these various, I think there's four classifications of pilots. Is that right? Yeah. Um, so Is there like a thousand, a hundred thousand, ten million? How many pilots do we got? So uh, the number varies, obviously, but we're somewhere at any given time, we're somewhere between 300 and 500,000 pilots. Wow. So pretty big number, but our numbers are dwindling a lot, a lot. Uh, and the reason is, is because this new generation, they, um, they're more comfortable getting medical intervention. You know, we find the older generations are the uh, rub dirt on it and walk it off generations. The younger generations are more willing to go to a doctor. So the younger generation has more medical complications in the eyes of the FAA, the air quotes on complications that make them, uh, not qualified in the eyes of the FAA to hold a medical certificate. Wow. So we're not getting the youth into the industry, which has led Congress to say, oh no, what do we do? And right now there's a bill pending that will, uh, some legislation pending that will increase the forced retirement age of airline pilots from 65 to 67, which is a total red herring because they don't understand that it's not about keeping who we have. It's about no. making sure that line's coming through. Right. Right. And they're not coming through. Yeah. So, and, and also that generation, even if they, even if they're medically able to become a pilot, uh, they're, they're smart. That generation is smart, right? Our education system has gotten better. We're very smart, uh, all the way down. That's the way a country should be, right? You hope the youth is getting smarter. Um, they are looking at this saying, I got to spend at a minimum, a quarter of a million dollars up to a million dollars for flight training. And I could lose that in the blink of an eye once a year. Not worth it. Yes. It's not a good investment. Wow. So, so is the is the industry trying to look at this from a section of oh well, eventually like we're thinking driverless cars. Yeah. Is it eventually like well, if we can just hold on, we're, we're going to have automated flying to the point that it's like a drone, like we can fly this thing from the tower or something yeah. like that. Is is there a thought behind that? Like the human component isn't necessary or are they just not thinking this through? There is a push there. There is certainly a push to make the um, flying autonomous. And there's a push right now, legislation proposed, where we would have one airline pilot up in front. So you would get on a United flight and you would see one person up there. And I could already tell by your eyes, how is that going to be that received by the public? Me. <laughs> right. So I don't know that you're, the FAA is eventually going to run into this position. Congress is going to run into this position that we've been running into the entire time on aeromedical reform, where their thoughts are going to be judged by the court of public opinion. And they're going to see the resistance that we've been facing the entire time because I, I promise you, members of the general public, it'll take them a long time before they walk onto a United flight, look left, and see nobody. Yes, so. I agree. Man, that – and see, all these things would never even pop my mind had we not had this conversation. And so I think these are really eye-opening considerations because the air transport system, no matter what stage you're at, it brings convenience it brings people together. It brings commerce. It brings protection. All of this stuff comes through, at one way or another, through flight and right. pilots. And right. so this is a big deal. Right. Absolutely. What, what have you found to be some of the more, um, let's just call it egregious offenses in someone losing their license to, to the degree of, not, I'm not saying that someone, you know, created a, or uh, committed a crime and then it was taken away. Yeah. Like something that people, what are some of the things that people wouldn't expect? Like, wait, you lost your license for that? And, and talk to those a little bit. Oh, you hit me at a, a very uh, a, a convenient time <laughs> <laughs> or a particular time. So right now we're currently dealing with uh, the FAA and the VA, uh, both public health authorities, both, both designated public health authorities under HIPAA shared records. And the FAA shared medical applications. The VA shared VA disability benefit memos. And the FAA grounded greater than 2,000 veterans. 
um, essentially overnight. So that's not a HIPAA violation because of this, this clause in the contract that you were talking about earlier on that form or? So uh, I would argue it is, okay. and we are currently arguing it is. We're, we're currently uh, asking through congressional inquiries, how did this happen? Um, and we haven't gotten a clear answer on that. So that is very ongoing. This is so new that it's very ongoing. But that one, I think adequately, this investigation, I think adequately demonstrates the frustration that we're seeing on the medical certificate defense side. So if you talk to a veteran, when they separate, um, they are counseled by a separation counselor to report anything, right? You did your time serving yep. this country. If your finger hurts, report it right now. We'll throw some benefits Go at it. Go take care of it. Right. Yep. And it's not for right now. You'll hear a separation counselor say, these benefits are not for right now. They're for later. So if you uh, broke your arm as a 19-year-old in Afghanistan and you got it addressed then and you separate at 20, um, maybe that arm doesn't hurt at age 20. Maybe it doesn't hurt in the 30s. Maybe it doesn't hurt in the 40s, 50s, 60s. But when you're 70, maybe that arm starts to hurt again, right? From that service-connected injury when you were 19. And VA benefits give that uh, service member the ability to treat that condition um, in their later years. So a lot of these uh, veterans we're finding as they separate and they go, they transition from the flying world in the service to the flying world in the civilian sector, they have these benefits that they're not even in their mental. They're not even thinking about these. They address them once at the separation meeting and then they haven't thought about them again since and they didn't report them on their medical application because it's not in their mental. And these benefits of like, you know, um, lumbar strain, uh, lumbar sprain, um, stuff like that, uh, the FAA has grounded pilots off of that. And it, it's something that these pilots aren't even, they're not even in a care plan for. They're not even being treated for. That's insane. And it's, it, it's stuff like that where you look and you say, well, is that really within the FA's purview, right? Why are they enforcing on that? It simply doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make sense. And I think that doesn't make sense to anybody, whether you're a doctor like yourself, whether it, uh, you're a pilot like me, it, it, it doesn't make sense to anybody. So those are the frustrations that we're having right now. I think that adequately demonstrates like the, uh, uh, the pause of FA, what are you doing? Is that really significant? Is that significant to public, uh, to the public right now? So. Right, and, and think about this too, Joe. Like, I don't know how many of these pilots through, especially as they get up into the higher sophistication classes where they're, mm -hmm. you know, a, a commercial pilot or whatever, but their insurance, right? They have health right. insurance and they're having to pay a lot of money for health insurance. So right. they have these conditions, whether it be, you know, a mental, an emotional uh, support need or whether it's a physical need or whether they need to be on a certain medication that would ban them from flying or whatever it be, they need to go see their doctor. And I know that it's not, um, what you can't do is you say, well, I saw this person and send it back over here to their direct records, unless there's very specific parameters. But I also know that even in the world of just checking for um, what usage rates are of different medical expenses that a company can get with their insurer yep. and say, Hey, tell me what did we spend last year in mental health stuff? What did we spend in chronic disease stuff? What did we spend in diabetes type stuff? And if you start getting those trends and you have this onerous ability to take away someone's deal from that, it, somehow you're going to start throwing bells and whistles up to say, I want to find those people. Right. Am yes. I, am I missing that? Like no. this is all coming together for me. Right That's now. right. Yeah, you're a hundred percent right. Yeah, it's the the VA one has been a, a very um, that one that one I think hurts. That hurts the public. That hurts the industry. It, it it hurts all the way around. It hurts the FA's relationship with pilots. It hurts the pilots' relationships with doctors. It's uh, that was a that was a very bad investigation done very very poorly. So, what should pilots? I want to break this into two questions. What should pilots know to be wary of? And I know you're not going to say, hey, don't report, don't do this. Yes. Like you got you to stand on the line of the, the truth and right. what's right. But two groups of people here, there's a pilot and he or she is doing their thing and they're just going about their life. And like you say, they're human like the rest of us. Yeah. And 
you know, they, they may have to take Sudafed for allergies or whatever, right? They may have to do something like that. Right. Or they may have to, um, you know, they may have to go see someone after a loss of a relationship or right. something. What would that group need to know? And what would the people like you talked about earlier, the young or the new pilots or potential pilots, what do they need to know when going down this path? Because it seems yeah. like you take one wrong step and you're going to have a problem. You're exactly right. Uh, Firstly, um, if you take Sudafed, you have to ground for 60 hours. So Really? <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're talking about over-the-counter medication, Benadryl, Sudafed. 60 hours. <laughs> 60 hours from the point of consumption to uh, when you can operate an airplane again. I mean, there's, the rules are just, they're archaic. They're absolutely archaic. Um, in any event, in that question, it's the exact same answer. So I would start by saying, if you need medical attention for whatever, whether it's mental health stuff, whether it's you're concerned about a spot on your skin and you need to go to a dermatologist, um, please, please, please put your health first, right? Um, and I know that even, like I even cringe a little bit when I say it as a pilot, right? My pilot hat comes on and goes, no, no, no. I, <laughs> I, put, I put flying first, <laughs> put aviation first. Um, but please prioritize your health, prioritize your health, make sure that you're the best, best part of you that you can put forward to the FAA, that things are, yes, there may have been an issue, but you took care of it. And that is asymptomatic. It's no longer a diagnosis. It's dormant. It's past. It's in the, it's, it's history. Take care of you first and then be proactive, right? Talk to an aviation attorney, uh, informally chat with an AME, uh, make sure you know, just like you would in a, in a battle, right? Make sure you know what the defense has, right? What Make sure you know what arsenal the FA is coming out with. Make sure you know which fields have booby traps and mines. Um, it's far easier as an aviation attorney to work with a pilot ahead of time um, and then present the best part of that pilot to the FAA uh, from square one as opposed to having to backtrack and say, okay, all right, so that issue is now addressed here and this issue is here. And then you end up in this long circle where you know pilots will wait uh, 15 months, 18 months uh, before they're even reconsidered again. So. Is, is this anything like, I mean, that is so amazing to me. <clears throat> is this anything like business owners and for that matter, private citizens needing accountants and they give their accountants the stuff that they're doing, their financials, so that the accountants can have the tax preparation ready right. for that year's taxes so that they don't get anything messed up. Meaning, should um, should most pilots have an attorney like they would have an accountant or like they would have a doctor or a financial advisor? Should they have an attorney that knows aviation law? Absolutely. Absol what percentage it's do? Um, a lot of the airlines do. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can tell you there are a lot of uh, airlines, uh, very large airlines, um, that, that have our business cards sitting in their pilot lounge. Um, I know a lot of pilots who travel around with them as well. It, it's, it's funny you say that because I've never, ever thought of it like that, but it's 100% um, true. You should have an aviation attorney, you should have your headset, and you should have a pen going into the cockpit. Um, it, it really, really is a necessity nowadays. It really is, especially wow. as medicine evolves and the FA is left in the, in the dust, right? Well, and tell people why it's such an important thing. You and I have, again, have this conversation off air here you know, many times, yeah. but the challenges from my perspective is once you get into the system, air quotes, you can't get out. And so now, what would you rather have so, an advocate on your side to help you walk through before anything happens or get into a system that you have to pay? I think you might have told me upwards of 20 or 30 grand a year. Now they're almost now they're almost extorting your money yes. even though you have a controllable condition that's no big deal, but yet you can't get out of the program without buying your way till out till next year until next year. Am I right on that? That's correct. Yeah. And, and, uh, a lot of pilots listening to this will know that program as the HIMS program. H I M S H I M S. Yep. That program is a, uh, um, you know, I actually started my career putting pilots into that program. It's for those that were struggling with substance abuse, substance dependence, uh, uh, substance use issues as the current DSM calls it. 
Um, those pilots, um, that program was really, really good. It got them what they needed. A lot of them were self-medicating because they couldn't see a psychiatrist because they couldn't see a psychologist. So they were self-medicating with alcohol, got them through that, that hump in their life and got them right back into the cockpit with proper education. Nowadays, my career has shifted from putting people into that program to honestly taking people out of that program um, because that program has lost the plot and it's become very much a, a, a revenue generator for uh, everyone other than pilots. So, wow. um, but yeah, it, it, it definitely is when you get stuck in those cogs, um, you know, you could get stuck in the cogs as easy uh, as having a kidney stone. A one-time event kidney stone, not drinking enough water, got a calcified kidney stone. Uh, the FA knows your name now, right? And they're looking at every single medical application that you're submitting. Um, the average turnaround time right now on a kidney stone, a single kidney stone, is six months. Meaning so, you report it <clears throat> and they don't get back to you for six months and you're correct. grounded in the meantime? That's correct. Um, it's it's The whole system has, has lost the plot, if I'm very honest with you, but... Um, but that's why I'm saying it's, it's better to front load because at the end of that, like if we use kidney stones as an example, if you were just to go to your AME and say, I have a kidney stone, they would defer your medical. It would sit in Oklahoma city for six months. They would send you a letter back after six months saying we need this, 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 and this, and please explain to us this. But um, your kidney stone's gone by then long ago. It's passed or it's been treated. It's, it's right. It's nothing. Right. And now, now you have to comply with that letter. And then you wait another, you know, four to six months and then they look at it and decide, well, now it's been a while and maybe those tests aren't as current as they could be. So why don't you get another ultrasound? Why don't you get some more lab work? And then you get all that and then you go back and what, what, what started out as six months ends up as two years very quickly in the blink of an eye. So that's why it's important to have somebody on your side advocating at the very beginning. Now, people always say to me, well, I have my AME. I have my aviation medical examiner. They're an advocate. By definition, they are not an advocate. By definition, they are an evaluator of the FAA. They don't even develop a patient-physician uh, relationship. They're not even protected by that. Wow. Um, which means they're also not covered under insurance. Which means they're also not they're protected from medical malpractice. It's a, that that is a whole nother topic altogether of the exact role of an AME because there also is no contract between them and the FAA, though they're acting as an agent of the FAA. Really, kind of a legal um, uh, rabbit hole that we could run down there. But the the moral of that story is they are not an advocate. They can't be an advocate. They have to be an advocate for the FAA. So who's fighting for you? And for a lot of pilots, it's no one. And, and their private doctors outside of those folks, can't they can't fight for them. Right. There's That's nothing correct. that they can do because if they just do the notes, which they should, and if it gets reported and sent them in, they can't necessarily just, from what I hear you say, like if someone came to me for back pain as a chiropractor and then that's a, a preclusive factoid that now they can't fly or they're right. limited or whatever, I can't necessarily just write a letter and say, no, guys, he's good. He came in for three visits of chiropractic care, good to go clear like i could for a worker situation right yeah you cannot do that and the fa would receive that letter and say well dr hoven doesn't know anything about aviation standards right you have to be an aviation doctor what does that really mean you have to be an agent of the faa right so the fa only trusts their own that's a very frustrating aspect of our job as well super frustrating i wanted to ask you um what is it in in that process of these folks getting getting licensed and staying licensed that they should really watch out for that they might not be thinking of. So we've talked about mental health. We've yeah. talked about um, back pain and musculoskeletal health just in, in yeah. passing. We've talked about a few things, but what might they not think of? Like if you've ever blank, because I know some of these questions, have you ever, like you said, have you yeah. ever, can you just give a, a list of those things? Sure. So it's it's box 18 on the 8500-8. It's question number 18, and it goes A through W. And what it is is it's do you presently have any symptoms of a diagnosis of or have you ever in your life experienced is the way that question goes. And I'm almost um, – I may have actually said that word for word. So um, <laughs> you, it, You've seen it a few times. <laughs> right. And in, the, in that box, you have like um, – Stomach trouble is one of them. General stomach trouble, like I a don't stomach know. ache. I don't know what that means. Yeah. <laughs> but stomach trouble is one. Allergies is one. Uh, asthma is one. Um, 
another one that that binds people up a lot is um uh adhd is under mental uh it's under general mental health <laughs> i believe is the category of it adhd is a big one um that catches a lot of the the younger generations that they're going to check yes to that and adhd is 100 percent a grounding offense um Substance abuse, which is not a recognized term anymore uh, in the DSM-5. Substance dependence, which is not a recognized term in the DSM-5. That's on the list. That list is so significant and is so detailed, and it ends with or other. So the FAA is expecting you to put in something, right? And if they get something, they have a regulation, 14 CFR 67 for, um, 413, that says that they can ask for medical records on anything. So if you put in there, um, yeah, I went to the doctor because I clipped the edge of my finger off when I was preparing dinner one day, right? Um, and you wrote that in other, well, they could send you a 413 letter requesting all the medical records from that. And if they look at the medical records from that event and they find out that you once took Adderall when you were four, that's it. You're grounded. So that little nick of a finger has now resulted in you not flying again. Yeah, it's extrapolating the data past the thing that they're looking at. Now they can look at anything. Exactly right. That is wild. And yeah. I, I guess if we circle back one more time just briefly on this, I'm sure people got some of the message as to why, but what would be their ultimate benefit in doing this? Is it because they can get revenue from the him side or is it because they are they just want to keep people safe or because they're lazy or because like why why is this to their advantage to keep doing this, which makes no sense to anybody watching or listening? I, I wish I had an answer to that. Mm. I wish I had an answer to that. Every time I've had the ability to speak to an FAA doctor, I have always gotten the speech of, you know, Joe, we're just trying to protect this guy. We're just trying to check, protect the general public. We're trying to protect this guy. Um, but their scope has just blown up from something that was aeromedically significant um, to, um, to just anything ever. And, and, and that's what I'm saying is why we, this is a, such an important year. Um, September, 2023, we need aeromedical reform. We need Congress to turn around to the FAA and say, hey, you guys can't exist like this anymore. You can't, you need, to, you need to keep up with clinical medicine. You need to trust doctors that are actually seeing these pilots that are, that are examining patients and that are in the trenches, so to speak. You guys can't just sit in your, in your lofty uh, tree house and judge. Yeah, without even examining the patient, without getting them in front of you, you're just looking at medical records and making the decision about a person's life. Yeah, you, that needs to change. That absolutely needs to change. Um, and I will. Uh, uh, this this one might be a little bit. Uh, this 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 might separate some people, some <laughs> listeners. But so uh, we deal with a lot with PTSD, especially on the veteran side of the house. And I have always advocated that the FA needs to focus on aeromedical concerns. That's what Congress told them to do, aeromedical concerns. That means, does that medical condition impact their ability to fly an airplane, right? That's it. It's not that they have that condition at all. It's that that condition specifically impacts their ability to fly an airplane. And for a lot of, especially our flight for life pilots, our helicopter pilots, that's what they did in the Army, in the, in the Navy, in the Air Force, in the Marines. They were flight for life Black Hawk drivers. Um, and a lot of them have come out with PTSD from having to pull soldiers out and civilians out in the field and, and having to be in close contact and close combat. Um, a lot of them do have PTSD from that event. Uh, but their, their PTSD is maybe they have problems being at a concert. They have problems being uh, in, uh, associating with general public, but they find their happy place and they are otherwise asymptomatic when they are flying a helicopter. So in those cases, I would argue that that condition is not aeromedically significant. Yes, yes, they have PTSD, but it is not something that the FA should utilize to ground them. So uh, that has been uh, um, a big push. And that goes back to your question of why do they do what they do? I don't. I don't know, because in my mind, I want those guys flying, those guys and gals flying, and I want Congress to tell the FAA to let those guys and gals fly. That's incredible. And you, you wrote to that effect. You were asked by Twin and Turbin Magazine, which is a, a big deal in the, in the uh, aviation industry, to write about this navigating the, the medical treatment process in this. Um, and you said you shared many of the thoughts that you and I have talked about today. 
um, what was the precipitous? Why, why did they want to know that? I mean, obviously they think it's more than just a small interest story. If this huge magazine asks you as the expert in the country on this issue for input, what was that all about? You know, we've been we've we've been very very fortunate. Uh, a lot of these uh, industry publications have been reaching out recently. Um, the federal air surgeon, Dr. Susan Northrup, came out and spoke on medical health issues, and she advocated for pilots to get help. Um, and we've been very fortunate that we have been that squeaky wheel for many many years, saying this is a problem, this is a problem, this is a problem. And now all of a sudden, the federal air surgeon acknowledges it's a problem without any changes acknowledges that it's a problem, but doesn't have a solution to that problem yet. Um, but because she did that, to her credit, she has kind of shined a spotlight on uh, the issue that we've been yelling for forever. Um, and so um, it's, it, we're in a, we're, I, I'm just absolutely blessed that, that she did that and these publications are reaching out and we're able to touch more pilots, more people to really use the momentum, use the platform, use that foot in the door to kick that door wide open and to say, yes, this is a problem, let's fix it. Let's fix it. Let's explore the prog problem totally and let's fix it. So very fortunate that they reached out. That is beautiful. And you've done, I know you've done stuff on um, TV and you've lectured to different types of, of legal groups to talk about this issue. You're really, um, from everything I watch you, and I'm watching from the sidelines as your biggest <laughs> cheerleader, right? Because yes, I'm not an attorney, so I'm just cheering you on and giving you whatever support I can. But you're leading the way because you love the aviation industry. You love piloting. You love pilots. And that's just, I mean, it exudes out of you. Every time we talk, you just bleed this stuff. And, and yeah. uh, it's, it's amazing to me that you're willing to, to be essentially kind of that spearhead. You know what I mean? Like, hey, take on all comers because it's the right thing to do. How do you get fuel to keep going because again you're you're charging hard across the country on this issue this isn't a denver colorado thing this is a usa thing where do you get rejuvenated and how do you just keep the the mission going honestly it's the pilots uh they reach out all the time they reach out on on my social media they call me they stop me on the flight line when i'm flying um and their words of positivity when whenever i have a pilot who's just gotten an FAA letter. I get this line all the time where when we chat with them and just say, all right, let's work through this letter. Don't worry about it. You're gonna fly, but let's work through this letter. Let's conquer the hurdles that we need to conquer. I always get them, you hear, you, you hear them, audibly hear them in their voice, just, just take a breath, right? And they think somebody is advocating for me. Somebody is pushing for me. Somebody is pushing for this industry. And that response from those pilots, even if we don't represent them and they're just stopping on the flight line to say, hey, man, I see what you're doing. I appreciate you. That is so motivating uh, because I treat every single pilot. And I, I think any pilot would say the exact same thing. Um, Dr. Ramos, who's a pilot, I bet if he asked him, he would say the exact same thing. Uh, those are my brothers and those are my sisters, right? Like we are a family that is a, my identity. And I feel, I feel like um, there's a burden that I have the ability, I have the platform, and I have uh, the capabilities to do this. So I have to do it, right? I have to speak for them. And uh, a lot of them uh, aren't, aren't able to do that, but it's their desire to have that, that voice. That's what motivates. And so. you know what <clears throat> motivates me too? When you first came here, and we joined forces since that time, your team has expanded. And yes. now you've got, I mean, I know because I look at all the numbers, the number of calls that we take, we have several people dedicated just to the phones for pilot intakes, whether they be A, like some of the, the fortunate ones that say, I saw you on TV, I read something, I heard you speak, and I just want to have you as my guy in case I need a guy. Yeah. yeah. So, so we answer those calls and then we answer calls like you're talking about people that are saying, wait a minute, my whole life might be just have gone down the gutter. Like I need your help now, but you have a team behind you that is ridiculous. Everything from now a young guy, Taylor, who's going into law school, he's in law school now finishing his first year to come out and do this to Zeke and Emma describe how you've been able to help more people 
and, and really dig into this issue by the team that you have and what they provide for you? Yeah, you know, aviation law used to be just kind of that, that fun thing that an attorney would do on the side, right? They were a real estate attorney, they were a business attorney, and they liked airplanes, so they would do a little bit of aviation law on the side. And I am very, very fortunate and blessed and proud to say that we are, the division is an aviation division. That is what we do. Um, Zeke uh, Dennison is a brand new attorney with us and his entire focus, his entire mission was defend pilots medically. That's it, defend pilots medically. And so we've taken what used to be kind of that, that you know, fun thing that you do on the side type of law and we've even gone um, niche to niche to niche all the way down to the point where Zeke's entire mission is to defend pilots. Um, I am so blessed to have that. He's, he's an amazing asset. Uh, Emma is our aviation uh, paralegal who came with no aviation experience. She now has a student pilot's license and a medical um, and loves talking to pilots and vice versa. <laughs> pilots <laughs> love chatting with her. She's that calm, that calm voice that lets them know you're all right. Don't worry about it. We're going to get you through this. Um, her knowledge in the industry is growing day by day by day. And I'm so impressed that uh, as a paralegal that she she's one grasped on to this industry, but two, uh, really really understands the passion of what we're doing right the importance of what we're doing that this is more than just legal work and so, you you have affected taylor's life greatly and taylor was a, a law clerk uh or an intern i think he was an intern, intern at that started, time yep. um and when when i got hired and i immediately snatched him and said he's coming to me <laughs> <laughs> yes you <laughs> very did. selfishly i did that <laughs> um and He's now taking uh, uh, pilots. Uh, he's, he's a student pilot. He's uh, a couple lessons in right now. He's currently going to law school in South Dakota. And his whole focus is aviation law, aviation law, as he's stepping through law school. I mean, think about that. Uh, there wasn't even a class offered in the United States for aviation law back when I was going to law school. And he's now stepping through law school with the mindset of, I'm going to be an aviation attorney. So every single legal class, he's thinking, how does this apply to aviation law? How does this apply to aviation law? How does this apply? It's, it's, it's unbelievable to, to think of his potential coming out of law school with that type of focus and desire and drive going through law school. Yes. So and, you know, the, very one excited. The, one of the coolest things I've seen from all of this is watching your ability to grow and take on different things because you have a team now that you don't have to do everything. Right. And yes. I, it, it's been why and you, you still carry the same workload as when I met you only now it's a different <laughs> workload because you got other people helping, but it's to the point where you're getting calls from other attorney disciplines or types because they might be involved in something where they have a pilot and maybe it's a criminal attorney yes, sir. and it could screw up their, their deal. So they now, after hearing you talk at their symposiums and their educational events, these attorneys, they're saying, Hey Joe, before I move on this case, what do I need to know? Same thing. Then this is a whole different kettle of fish. We won't get into on this show, but if someone's been in an airplane crash, yes, you, you work on those cases because a regular, even an injury attorney in an airplane crash, th those are not the same as car crashes. And so you're getting calls from all over the country on this stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what I, what I, what I, uh, pointed out earlier is I am so fortunate to be able to work this industry now from a macro level industry wide, right? Whereas before, you're exactly right. I, I didn't have the opportunity to do a defense bar CLE. I didn't have the opportunity to, to speak to those attorneys because I was so focused on, well, I got to help this pilot and I got to help this pilot and I got to help this pilot. And now we have such a talented team helping those pilots that we can go and say, okay, how do we stop pilots from being in this situation where they need us? Um, and I know that sounds like we're hurting ourselves, but it's really not because it's benefiting this industry that we can go into these other areas of pilots' lives and say, hey, make sure you know they're a pilot and they need this and this and this. It's, it's an amazing, amazing opportunity and it's been a, a fantastic journey. It really, really has been an amazing journey. Well, this has been an amazing conversation, my friend. I mean, I could spend all day working with you. We wouldn't get anything done. I'd <laughs> yes, learn about sir. aviation or you'd fly me somewhere <laughs> and then we'd do some fishing, but these are such great conversations. Thank you for taking time. Um, is there any advice that you would like to share with our listening audience as we exit here about what it's like to live. Um, if you want to live life at the highest levels, what one principle would you say, man, try this because you're living it up in the sky, right? You're, you're top gun without the top gun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like what, what, uh, what piece of advice or wisdom would you give on that front? So I would say, try this. 
exactly what you just said to me. Try this. Um, I, I've experienced this all through uh, aviation, right? Where I've always had that love. I've always had that passion. But then I look at a bigger airplane and a faster airplane and a different mission. And I thought, wow, that's really intimidating. <laughs> I would really like to do that. I have a passion for it. I would really like to do it. But that's intimidating. And there's no way that I'm qualified to do that. But it takes that, that, that part of you to say, you know what, I'm going to try it. I'm going to do it, right? And then next thing, that thing is not, you know, you transition from a Cessna to a, you know, to a Cirrus, to a Pilatus, to a TBM, to a jet, to a, you know, and you move all the way through because you're willing to put yourself out there. You're willing to risk it and you're willing to say, you know what? I do have a passion. I should try it <laughs> and nice. go on from there. So, I love it. So I'd, yeah, I'd reverse that question and just say, try it. Try it. Let's try it. And if people wanted to try getting a hold of you, <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> what would they do? How would they reach out to connect with you to, to learn more about aviation, uh, ask a question, uh, get signed up to have you protect them or to be their, their lead dog, if you will? What, what's the best way for people to reach you? Ramoslaw.com, Ramoslaw on every single platform. Uh, Instagram, TikTok, uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, reach out. We have an amazing team here where, um, you know, if somebody reaches out through a, an Instagram post uh, and, they, and they say, hey, I'd really like to talk to Joe, I know about it within seconds. I mean, it feels like that. It feels <laughs> like I know about it so quick and we're able to reach out to those individuals and say, hey, what did you need? So any, any platform that Ramos Law is on, please reach out. Uh, they will direct you right to me. That's awesome. Well, Joe, thank you so much for the time, man. This was great. I can't believe how fast it went. We're look, we're an okay. hour into this thing. It seems like ten minutes ago we yeah, started. Yeah, we still got to talk about uh, crash litigation too. That's a whole nother oh, uh, can of worms. We're doing that on the next episode. <laughs> yes, sir. All right, my friend. Thank you. Have a blessed day, and I can't wait to hang out with you. We'll do some fishing. Thank you, sir. All I right. look forward to Take it. Take care.